Hello friends and welcome to this first installment of a new online midweeks Bible study resource with Augusta Road Baptist Church. If this is your first time joining our community of faith, I am Matt King and I have the privilege of serving as our church's senior pastor. And I want to thank you for joining us and for watching this video. In this time of continued physical distancing in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, we wanted to find new ways to resource as many of you as possible with a moment in the middle of the week a touch point, you might say, with the scriptures. And I hope that this will be a blessing to you. This is a different format for me, as I'm sure it is for many of you. Normally, we like to be in the same room together when we are studying the Bible. It was early in March when our normal uh, routines of weekly Bible study on uh, Sundays and Wednesdays was disrupted. And over the last few months, some of us have continued to gather with different groups in our community of faith online, over Zoom and other platforms for study. And those sessions seemed to work well for a while. We especially enjoyed the fact that we could see each other's faces and we enjoyed the nuance and the innovation that allowed us to be able to study the Bible together, though we needed to be separated, at least for a time. Of course, everything comes with challenges. Like any set uh, time for a group to meet in person, determining an online time to meet can be difficult. You often cannot find a time that works for everyone. And even before the COVID disruption, work and personal schedules prevented many from getting together with us. Uh, also, I think the reality for many of us is that we have begun to face what you might call Zoom fatigue. We've been meeting online for so many different groups and for so many different discussions that we've gotten tired. Now finally, it can be a challenge to lead a discussion over an online platform, particularly like something for Bible study. And normally when I lead Bible study in a small group, I, I like to read the text and bring my own study and thoughts to the group and then throw the discussion wide open. I believe that the Spirit often works best when we are each bringing our own thoughts and gleanings from the text, and not simply when I preach or lecture. There are often points that someone will bring up and ways that someone will read the passage that we are studying that I hadn't even considered. Or they will see things from a different light, and it is clearly a perspective from which I need to learn. But making that happen over Zoom or another online platform can be quite difficult. And when our time of disruption and isolation began, we thought it was going to be temporary and quick. And we figured that in a matter of a couple of weeks, we'd get back to normal. And obviously, that was not what happened. In South Carolina in general and in Greenville County, where we are located specifically, the number of positive COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations continues to rise. That makes it so we have to continue to push back the possible timeline for us to gather in person on our campus again. So we are continuing to adapt. We're continuing to experiment. And we want to continue to find the best possible ways to resource our congregation and anyone who might need it with an opportunity for the reading and the study of the scriptures and then a time of personal reflection. To that end, each week on Wednesdays throughout the summer and perhaps for the foreseeable future, we will be posting midweek Bible studies of the scriptures. Each will roughly be about 30 minutes in length, and I will bring thoughts on the passage that I hope you will consider. I may even offer some reflection questions for you to consider once you've had a chance to view the video. And you should feel free, of course, to study the video at a time that works for you. And I would certainly encourage you to discuss it with your family and your friends. And our church family actually has a private Facebook group that would certainly be a fine place for our community of faith to share thoughts online and discuss with one another. But no matter what, I pray that as we read and study together, that we would be able to hear the good word from the Lord that each of us needs to hear. Now at this time, I also want to remind those in our community of faith that there will still be monthly opportunities to gather online over Zoom for what we're calling ARBC Family Dinners. The first will be on June 17th, and the second on July 15th, and then the third on August 12th. And We'll eat together around our own tables. We will fellowship together and pray together, and we'll even have some fun. There will also be opportunities in June and July to gather in our church parking lot for tailgate-style picnics. Bring your own food. We'll stay physically distant, wear a mask, but come and enjoy fellowship with your community of faith. These opportunities are going to be on June 27th and July 25th. And we'll also have a mission component for each of these days. So check your email and our Facebook page for more information. And we will look forward to seeing you online and in person when we can. But okay, let's get to it. 
When we sit down to read or study or listen to the scriptures, we each bring our own preconceptions of what it might say, at least those of us who have been raised in the church and have experience with the scriptures, we certainly do. Very few of us open up the Bible or sit down in the pew as the preacher steps up to the pulpit or the podium or the platform or the stage or these days when we simply push play on the video and we're a completely blank slate on which the Spirit can write and into which the Spirit can speak. Those of us who have been in the church for a while have been taught directly or indirectly about the nature of God and the ways that God works, at least from the perspective of our, our church and our pastors or our Bible study leaders and our parents. We've been shaped by what we have heard. We've also been shaped by how we try to apply the scriptures to our lives in the past. And some understandings resonated with our experience and they have stuck and they will stand the test of time. But others, the Spirit revealed, were way off base and needed to be replaced with newer and better understandings of what God was doing that hit much closer to the heart of Christ. But on the whole, many of us feel like we've got it figured out. I mean, think about it. Those of us who grew up going to Sunday school and vacation Bible school and youth group simply need to hear the name Joseph. And we have an image of some amazing technicolor dream coat. We also have some sense of what that story has to teach us. The same could be said of Moses and the liberation of the people of Israel. It could even be said for Jesus himself. We hear that Jesus is with a Samaritan woman at the well, or that he's talking with children, or a guy named Zacchaeus, or that he's walking on the water, or that he's telling parables about mustard seeds and moving mountains, or seeds sown in different kind of soil, or sheep being rescued by a good shepherd, or a man left for dead on the side of the road to Jericho, or a man who had two sons, or something about separating sheep from goats, and our minds are off to the races. Not only can we picture the scene, but we think we've got it figured out, and we had it figured out a long time ago. Is there still something to be found there? Has the well of that story run dry? If we aren't careful, we'll stop listening, or at least we won't listen for a new and good word for us, we will not open ourselves to the possibility of a new teaching and understanding that God can speak through the scriptures for us to see in our current time. And the beautiful thing about the scriptures, though, is that the Spirit is constantly breathing life into them to speak to us in new ways, to deepen our understanding of God and reveal the ways that the kingdom of God is still at hand and on the move among us. And if we aren't open... If we aren't prepared for the Spirit to speak in new ways, when it does reveal something new to us, it can catch us completely by surprise. The experience can be quite jarring, frankly. Jesus experienced this in his audiences firsthand. He seemed to experience it all the time. He was constantly reorienting people's understandings of what the Scriptures were trying to teach them. And sometimes he did it gently with compassion. Other times he did it in ways that shocked people, and that rocked them to the very core. There were times he simply offered a teaching with greater authority than they had experienced to that point, and it was like he hit them right in the face. Sometimes Jesus just gets in your face, and sometimes that's exactly what we need. We need to be shaken. So we're going to begin our study with a long series of passages where Jesus gets in our faces. And it, it seems important to me in this time of disorientation and reorientation, as we figure out how to emerge and create new patterns of life, we need Jesus to challenge what we think we know so that our understanding can be far deeper and better. So we begin in the book of Luke in chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. And this is a story that is told in all three of the synoptic gospels in Matthew and Mark and Luke. And Luke, it's toward the very beginning of the entire narrative of Christ. But that's not simply a matter of chronology. As Fred Craddock says, it's the beginning because it's first. Luke wants his audience to read or hear the story and understand its power and significance. And everything else we understand about the ministry of Jesus, at least according to Luke, needs to be viewed through this encounter. A lot has already happened in the Gospel of Luke. and Luke is the Gospel that we love to read, especially during the season of Advent that leads us to Christmas. Luke 2 is almost always read on Christmas Eve as it tells the story of the birth of Jesus with angels bringing good tidings to shepherds and declaring peace on earth to all people. Luke is also where we get Mary's song of praise, the Magnificat, where she bursts into song at the announcement that she is to give birth to God's Son, 
She sings about all the things that God is going to do through that child that has been promised to her by the angel. He will bring a reversal of fortunes where the lowly will be lifted up and those who use their power for evil will be brought down. But Luke also is where we remember the story of Jesus found in the temple in Jerusalem after his family has already left for their home in Nazareth. He's confronted by his mother and he reminds her that he already has a sense of calling and that he needs to be about his father's business. In Luke 3, we hear John the Baptist preaching a baptism of repentance, and along comes Jesus, now all grown up. He wants to be baptized along with the rest of the crowd. And when he emerges from the water, the Holy Spirit descends upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice from heaven speaks words of affirmation and claim him, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit leads him in the desert for a period of fasting and praying and preparing and ultimately temptation that he will overcome that will set him on the path to initiate God's kingdom. If this were a play specifically about Jesus' ministry and adult life, everything in those first three chapters are basically prologue. They're deeply significant, but it all sets the stage for what happens next. And as the curtain rises, Jesus comes home to Nazareth, and these are the people who knew him and raised him, and he knows them. And in this time, his reputation has preceded him back home. And they've heard what he's been doing. They're pretty remarkable things. And they're excited to see what he might do when he is at home with them. If he is a prophet called by God, as his reputation would suggest, then perhaps that is good news for Nazareth. Maybe something good is in store for them as well. It was the Sabbath, and Jesus was right back where he was supposed to be. He was in the synagogue for worship. We could think of the times when generations have gathered in the pew with their mother or their grandmother on Mother's Day. Everyone is excited to see them. There's so much pride as people are reintroduced and remark about how proud they are of what they've heard about the person who's returned home. Scholars have recognized that in the first century, Jewish worship already had a pattern to it. There would be readings of the Shema from Deuteronomy, and numbers. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with your heart, your soul, and all your might. Keep these words that I'm commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are alone, and when you are away, when you lie down, and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand and fix them as an emblem on your forehead. And write them on your doorposts of your house and on your gates. There would have been a recitation of the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. There would have been a series of 18 benedictions. There would have certainly been specific readings of the Scriptures, especially from the Torah, the Law, from those first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. By the test time, there would have been a three-year cycle of readings developed already for each Sabbath. And Psalms would have been read perhaps readings from the prophets, and if so, they would have likely been chosen because of their connection to the Torah readings. And now, any adult male could be asked to read the scriptures, and any adult male could be invited to give exposition on those scriptures and to preach. And finally, someone at the conclusion of the service would offer a blessing. When Jesus came to the synagogue on that Sabbath day, this is what happened. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. When Jesus, filled with the Spirit, returned to Galilee and report about him had spread through all of the surrounding country, he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, and he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight, the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him, and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said to them, 
Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months. And there were several famine and severe famine over the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up and drove him out and led him to the brow of a hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Jesus was given a chance to read and to preach in his home synagogue. Everyone was ready for something good. All eyes were upon him and the air was full of expectation. Now there were some times when you are planning a sermon, and if your tradition follows that three-year cycle of passages called the Revised Common Lectionary, like our church often does, and you will go to that source, and there will be three or four passages from which you can choose. They are assigned for that particular day in the season of the church year, and you read each and open yourself, praying that the Spirit will reveal to you the one that you need to preach for your congregation. There were other times, however, when you leave the assigned text behind. There was a particular message that you need to get across, and the Spirit has laid it on your heart, and you just have to preach it. In that case, you may feel called in a different direction. This may happen at a wedding or a funeral. There are certain texts that we often read at those occasions, but we also want to make it specifically about the deceased or the happy couple. So we pick our text because it says something specifically about the occasion, the ones that we're honoring. There are other times when a church needs to hear a particular message because of a challenge that it is facing, so you let the Spirit lead you. And still, there are other times when something is happening around the world and the congregation must grapple with what it means and where their place is in it. And in those times as well, you may find that the Spirit is leading you to a specific text for inspiration for the sermon. When it comes to Jesus' sermon at Nazareth, at least it is told in the Gospel of Luke, scholars seem to think that when Jesus stood up to preach, the attendant didn't simply hand him the scroll assigned for the day, or if the prophet Isaiah was assigned for that day, Jesus specifically chose the portion that he was going to read. This was a message that these people needed to hear right then and in that moment. So Jesus unrolled the scroll of the prophet Isaiah to the portions in chapter 61 and 58, where the prophet speaks of God's chosen, the anointed one, the Messiah, who will bring salvation to the people. Jesus wanted them to understand what was going on right in front of them and what it meant for them and for the entire world. These words from Isaiah share important things that the Messiah will do. The Spirit has come upon the Messiah, and Luke has already shown that the Spirit of God is intimately involved in Jesus' life to this point, ultimately ordaining and preparing him for ministry of truth centered in God's mission for the world. The Messiah brings good news. The Messiah proclaims release to the captives and those who are in bondage. The Messiah lets the oppressed go free. The Messiah proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus goes on to say that these things are happening right in front of them. They are happening in him. He is no longer simply a carpenter. He's no longer Mary and Joseph's little boy that they watched grow up. He is the one they have been waiting for. He is the one that their people have been waiting for for generations. Just read through the rest of the gospel and see how true these things are. Jesus releases people from all kinds of bondage and oppression. He releases the poor from economic oppressions and systems that profits off their backs. He releases people from physical oppression through physical healing. He helps them walk and see, and he relieves their pain, and they live like never before. And he releases people from cultural and political oppression. He brings God's justice through mercy and forgiveness. He releases people from demonic oppression by casting out spirits that have taken hold of them. And he preaches and declares forgiveness of sins and releases people from the inner iniquity that holds them in bondage each day and keeps them away from God. Jesus gives sight literally to the blind. 
But as one scholar wrote, he also figuratively is fulfilling God's work of salvation as foreseen through the prophet. Jesus is dramatically fulfilling the role of the one that would be the light for all nations. He helps the world to see in the midst of darkness. He makes all of God's ways clear. He declares the year of the Lord's favor or jubilee. The year of jubilee comes from Leviticus 25 when in the law it provided that every 50 years the fields that were farmed would be allowed to rest so that they might be replenished for future harvests. All debts were forgiven. Slaves were set free. Some scholars have even suggested that Jesus may have said these words in the middle of a literal year of jubilee around 26 or 27 when he began his ministry. And whether or not that's true, Jesus is ushering in a new time of God's ways. It's a time of forgiveness. And his ministry will look like the year of Jubilee is initiated. It's an age of liberation and freedom and abundant life. And it all sounds great, at least at first for those in the synagogue. They're impressed. What they seem to hear is that he is declaring God's favor. But he's not just declaring it for everyone. He's declaring it specifically for them. And if that is true, and if Jesus is famous, then Nazareth will be famous. They will be able to put up a sign on the interstate letting everyone know that this is where Jesus grew up. They're already ready to capitalize not only on his reputation, but they think that surely he will bring divine favor and blessings on all of them. Jesus seems to sense that they aren't completely getting it. They aren't following as closely as they need to in order to recognize what God is really doing So he reminds them that there have been times throughout Israel's history and even found in Israel's own scriptures where God worked outside of the people. He reminded them that the time of the prophet Elijah was on the run and the region was in famine. And God tells him to go to the town in the region of Sidon. So he does, and he meets a Sidonian woman, a widow. She offers him hospitality. And he and she and their son, her son, excuse me, are able to survive on resources that should have run out immediately. And when the woman's son dies, Elijah brings him back. Now, God could have sent Elijah to any of the widows in Israel, but did he? No, he sent him to an outsider, a Gentile. And then he spoke of Naaman, the Syrian general, an enemy who contracts leprosy. And he doesn't know what to do. And he's told by this Israelite girl who he's given as a servant to his wife that there's a prophet, Elisha, who might be able to help him. And Naaman goes to Elisha, prepared to pay him handsomely for his help, but he doesn't make it inside the door. He simply is given a mission, a prescription that he's to watch seven times in the Jordan, and he will be cleansed. He's a bit perturbed, understandably, and he, he doubts it will work, but the servants convince him to give it a shot. So he washes as instructed, and he's cured, and he's won over to God. Now, again, God could have called Elisha to cleanse any of those in Israel with leprosy, but he cleanses Naaman, an enemy. And as Jesus is telling these stories, suddenly it clicks with those who are listening in the synagogue. He's telling them that the promises of God are going to be finally brought to bear upon the world, but they are not going to only be for those in Nazareth or even for only those in Israel. What is happening in Jesus is for all of the world. It is for everyone And when they realize that Jesus is saying that the Messiah was coming, but in their minds he's coming for the wrong people, they drive him to the edge of town and they prepare to kill him. Now this was Jesus' inaugural address. If they wanted to know his mission statement, this was it. God was working through him to bless the poor and captives. God was working through him to declare favor. God was working through him to bless all the poor, all the captives. And he was going to recover the sight of the blind regardless of what tribe they belonged to. God was working through him to bring favor and blessings to all people, including Gentiles, and they just couldn't handle it. Jesus was bringing salvation to the world. He was bringing spiritual and personal salvation, yes, but he was also bringing about the kingdom of God that was at hand and on the move among them. He was about reversing power structures that kept people down. He was about releasing people from internal and external bondage. He was about bringing eternal life with God after death, but also abundant life here and now and for all people. And that has to be our mission too. As Christ followers, we benefit from this liberating work and we recognize the way that Christ works in our own lives to lift us up and set us free. And then we find our purpose in his purpose. We find our mission in his mission. And that is crucial if we're going to live fully into the life of the Christ follower. 
It shapes the way we see the potential of God's grace to work in the world. If we aren't shaped by it, we will miss out. New Testament scholar Alan Culpepper says it poignantly when he says that the people of Jesus' hometown read the scriptures as promises of God's exclusive covenant with them, a covenant that involved promises of deliverance from their oppressors. And Jesus came announcing deliverance, but it was not a national deliverance, but God's promises of liberation for all the poor and oppressed, regardless of nationality, gender, or race. And when the radical inclusiveness of Jesus' announcement became clear to those gathered in the synagogue in Nazareth, their commitment to their own community boundaries took precedence over their joy that God had set a prophet among them. And in the end, because they were not open to the prospect of others sharing the bounty of God's deliverance, they themselves were unable to read it. He see, says that this is not only paradigmatic of Jesus' life, but it's also a reminder of God's graces never subject to limitations or boundaries of nation or church or group or race. That we are excluded when we exclude human beings as instruments of God's grace for others. And when we set limits on receiving that grace... Throughout history, the gospel has always been more radically inclusive than any group or denomination or church. So we continually struggle with the breadth of love and acceptance that more nearly approximates the breadth of God's love. This is unlimited grace, but that often scandalizes us and we're unable to receive it. Jesus could not do more in his hometown because they were not open to him. So how much more might God be able to do with us if we were ready to transcend the boundaries of community and limits of love that we ourselves have erected. Now, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, particularly as we have had the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement in the wake of the senseless killing of some of our African-American brothers and sisters. I'm struck every time someone responds to the Black Lives Matter slogan by saying in response that yes, all lives matter. And I think I understand the basic premise that they're going for, and of course all lives matter, and knowing is saying that they don't. Each life is created in the image of God. Each has dignity and value and worth. And each is meant to be treated with respect regardless of any single characteristic. In this time, no one is saying that black lives matter more than any other lives. And the fact that we have to say that they matter at all just now in the 21st century is a tragedy, but we still do. We still don't seem to get it. We cannot simply declare the dignity and worth of all lives. It doesn't seem to do enough. We have to declare the dignity and worth of those specific lives because some people don't get it. Some people still see that some lives are less valuable than others. And black lives in particular have been subject to 400 years of our American original sin of systematic racism and slavery that we still have to repent and work for reconciliation. And I know if there are those out there who really do believe that white lives matter than black lives or Hispanic lives or Jewish lives or Muslim lives or LGBTQ lives, and they matter less, that's simply wrong and that's simply sin. Racism and bigotry of this kind is antithetical to Christ and it is plain wrong and sinful because it denies the innate equality of the single, every single life created in the image of God. Jesus had to combat an idea like this because he's dealing with people who had an understanding of themselves as favored over others. And yes, they experienced outside oppression and occupation, but still Jesus had to work to save the whole world, not just part of it. And yes, Christ knows uh, that God loves the world and we know that God loved the world through Christ. However, Jesus hit them in the face with the truth that even though all lives matter to God, God is always working hardest for those lives that are in danger. The poor, those who are unjustly imprisoned, those who are wounded and victimized, those who are put down because someone sees them as less than someone else simply because of a characteristic, something like the color of their skin. And those are the ones for whom God is working hardest to reshape the world because they have been hurt hardest by the world as it is. So yes, of course, all lives matter, but we need to get over ourselves. There continue to be systematic issues that our world puts specific lives at greater risk than others. Black lives are at greater risk. Hispanic lives are at greater risk. Poor lives are at greater risk. LGBTQ lives are at greater risk. And Jesus isn't saying that the lives of those people or the lives of the majority or those in power don't matter. He wasn't saying that Jewish lives didn't matter. He was saying that the life of everyone who was outcast and downtrodden and hurting that seemed that less than 
that's where the work of the kingdom is being revealed. They need specific attention. They need to be named specifically as having worth and value because everyone matters, but those have been ignored. And that was Christ's mission. It was radical, it was shocking, it was polarizing, and it still is today. And we need to allow ourselves to be awoken by it again, and I pray that we will be. In our church, we say that we're a loving, inclusive Christian community. That means not only that we are simply open to everyone, we are following Christ. It means that the good news that we have is specifically for those that everyone else overlooks. So let's pray we'll have courage to join in Christ's mission, to bring the good news to all people, but especially to those who have been overlooked and forgotten and those that the world has devalued. Let's join in proclaiming good news and easing burdens and bringing abundant life into the world. Because if it was Christ's mission, it has to be our mission. Thanks again for joining me today. And I hope you will take part again each week. I'll be praying for you. And in the meantime, stay safe. And remember that the grace of Christ our Savior and God's boundless love and the Holy Spirit's eternal and guiding presence is with us now and forevermore.